as knowledge with regard to the effects of food upon man increases, it is more than conceivable that the races that first avail themselves of the new values of nutrition may decrease the handicaps of disease, lengthen their lives, and so become leaders of the future by Victor Heiser. This is one of my favorite quotes, really, and it's, it's so apt. And I thought I should put it up because of tonight, the title of tonight's presentation, we are now beginning to see some of the powers of nutrition and how that, according to the title, can actually affect the way our genes function. When we understand that, we really will be able to understand how to release the natural forces that are within us, uh, which are the true healers. And without much further ado, I just want to say, uh, it's our, our honor to have our guest tonight to be a part of what we do. And uh, as Sherry will, will, will mention, um, Dr. Marvin has, for the past one year, he has he has devoted himself to helping us out, to uh, to advising, to giving giving us guidance and counsel in so many areas of what we're doing. So I'm extremely, uh, Sherry and, uh, and I really are very, very grateful to have Dr. Marvin. And Dr. Marvin, thank you again for for doing this presentation for us. Uh, Sherry, you want to go ahead? Yes. Dr. Marvin received a degree in pharmacy and a doctor of medicine from the University of Kansas and has now been in the practice of medicine for over 50 years. After spending 18 years in general practice, he served five years as assistant professor in the Department of Family Practice at the KU Medical Center. After five years, he returned to private practice. In 1988, he was asked to serve as Department Chairman of Family, Community, and Geriatric Medicine at Oral Roberts University School of Medicine in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Dr. and Mrs. Marvin returned to Kansas City area in 1993. He is now retired from the practice of traditional medicine, but maintains his membership in American Academy of Family Physicians and American Medical Association. He was also the host and teacher of his own radio program called What's Up Doc. He now speaks for many groups regarding the field of health and nutrition. He spends much of his time studying the newest literature in the field of health and longevity. Because of his medical background and his practicing as a family physician for 50 plus years, he has found his ability to interpret um, scientific materials and communicate this information to the average person one of his greatest assets. With this in mind, and still enjoying his many years of experience as a family physician, he has set a new goal of educating and sharing information with as many people as possible in an effort to help them improve the length and quality of their lives. Again, Dr. Marvin, I'll echo what David said. We're incredibly grateful for you, and I look forward to meeting you in person someday soon <laughs> and uh, giving you a great big hug. So, Dr. Marvin, are you there? I am here. Okay, welcome. Thank you, okay. and thank you for that very gracious uh, introduction. Uh, that makes me wonder if I can live up to it, Sherry, and, and also <laughs> to you, David. Uh, this topic is something that's consumed me for over three years, three and a half years, um, actually. Um, Doc? Yes. Doc, I, th I think you need to accept the link. Uh, it's, it's, it's been passed on to you. I, I may have to take it back so you can tr we can try it again. Let me try it again. Okay. Okay. All right. Just, if you don't mind, look out for the, the thing okay. in the center of the screen. Show my screen. Yeah, show my screen. Right. All right. Okay. Show my screen. Okay. There you go. Got it? There we yeah. go. Now, do I have control of my slides? You sure do. Okay. They aren't moving. Uh, you might have to left click on the screen, try left clicking, or right clicking on the screen and see if that works. Okay. Uh, ne next. Think, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, for the last three and a half years, nutrigenomics has been my passion because after all the years I've practiced medicine, and as you can see where I've been, which I've practiced medicine now for it's approximately 55 years, and I could tell many things weren't answered by traditional allopathic medicine and the dispensing of many drugs. 
they caused their side effects and problems. Sometimes the problems were greater than the benefit. So when I first got in to the nutrition field and saw what nutrition would do, I then wanted to know how nutrition worked. And from that, I got into nutrigenomics. And to start out to tell you, drugs will not change gene expression. Nutrition will. So we have the strongest drug available to mankind, and that's nutrition. Now, the problem has been said since the 70s. We have a problem all over the world, either excess or lacking of nutrition. We many times have excess of nutrition, which is the wrong type of nutrition. That's why we've got obesity as a growing, moving problem. And so this is what we're talking about. Now, nutrigenomics impacts aging as well as it does your health daily. Our genetic inheritance, inheritance plays an important role in defining our risks the risks that we have to most age-related diseases. But healthy aging is even more controlled by how we communicate with our genes through our diet and lifestyle. The attempt to analyze the nearly six billion pieces of DNA there are enclosed in a hundred thousand or more genes. Now that's a little controversial. Some people say 26,000 genes I have a recent paper I just took off the internet from a research article that says there is at least 50 to 100,000 genes now available. And we'll cover some of the reasons for that uh, misunderstanding or, or difference in opinion. These 100,000 or more genes which are enclosed in 46 chromosomes that make up our human inheritance factors. So we have six billion pieces of DNA that are enclosed in a hundred thousand genes which are enclosed in 46 chromosomes that make up our human inheritance factors. Only a small percentage of the above have completely been analyzed. For example, there's only two people in the world that have ever had their human genome completely read. One is James Watson who was one of the co-founders of the Helix and got the Nobel Prize for it with Crick in 1953. And the other one is Greg Vetter, who was on the Human Genome Project, which was started in 2000. And he also has had his completely read and wrote a book correlating what he did in life and how it affected, was affected by his genome. Anyhow, only a small percentage of the above on all people have been completely analyzed, and one of the reasons that's so expensive. The genome. We have, as we said, 46 chromosomes. They're in pairs. And if you uncoil, uncoil this one alley or one half of the gene chromosome, we see the DNA as it comes off into the helix. And last week, Dr. Murray so aptly presented the four bases, the adenine, the cysteine, and the thiamine, and the guanine. And that's what makes up the language of all of our living bodies. And here's a picture of the chromosomes. And you can see they go from the largest to the smallest. And as you see one, two, three chromosomes, and it goes on down, and you know that Down's disease <coughs> is triosomy 21. If you look down at the bottom, you see there's only two chromosomes there. Well, in People who have Down's disease are born with it. That's a chromosome abnormality and not a disease. It's a chromosome abnormality. There's three of those chromosome uh, particles there, and that's why it's trisomy 21. You can see 22. Now, when you get to X and Y, that's the difference between male and female. Females have two X's, and males have an X and a Y. Now, if you look at it, just a small fragment of DNA particles stacked up there makes the Y. And there's a large, large one makes the X. And the only thing that I've come up with is that when God made females, he had to have a lot more chromosome for them because they're more complicated completely. And men are kind of easily uh, differentiated. But 
you know, I probably would find a lot of people to argue with me. <laughs> Anyhow, that's the way it works. The genome, which is the whole presentation of your genetic being, takes you to the heart of the cellular level and shows you how our genes work in response to physical challenges impacting structure and function of our cells. The key to nutrition and the effect of nutrition has always been structure and function of our cells. The challenges are radiation, chemical, and nutritional. There are over 3,600 gene-related challenges produced by our environment, our nutrition, and the different toxins that we come in contact with. Now, these are not diseases. Traditional medicine calls them diseases, but these are genetic abnormalities with gene expression. You see, you have good genes and bad genes. And when you get in an environment, you stimulate the bad genes with toxins and different adverse things, just like when you eat poor nutrition, you don't have sufficient nutrition in your life, you stimulate these negative genes instead of the positive ones. Look at the genes as related to the topic tonight, like light switches. You have good nutrition in your body, or your mother had good nutrition when she was carrying you in the womb. You had all the switches on. When you don't have that, and you have poor nutrition, you have the switches off. And it's kind of like either light switches or circuit breakers, but umpteen thousand of them are all in effect as we, from the time of conception till our death. All these have lights flashing, so to speak, good ones or bad ones. That behooves us from the moment that we're born to have sufficient nutrition. Breast milk satisfies that. It's the ideal food for humans. I've studied breast milk in all aspects. It's the ideal food. But there comes a time when you have to get away from breast milk and go into different types of nutrition because we're growing and getting bigger and we have more demands on our fat that we need in our body and the proteins and etc. Nutrients influence gene expression. That's the key tonight. Nutrients influence gene expression. Remember I said drugs won't. Unhealthy genes are downregulated or suppressed when you have good nutrition. Wellness promoting genes are upregulated, benefiting structure and function of all of our cells. We have a hundred trillion cells in our body. They recognize that. In general, people do not have the plant molecules needed today by our cells to function properly. We have to have plant molecules, phytochemicals, phytonutrients, whatever you want to call them. Our bodies were made in an era much different than what we live in today. It was in an era where fish was consumed as the primary meat and there wasn't anything other than vegetables, fruits, or vegetation, whatever form it was in, for the man at that time to eat. And that's why our bodies were set up. We've changed that completely. It's a whole new world we're trying to fit our body into and it rejects a lot of these things that we now put into it and the result is we lose our genetic makeup wins because we age quicker, we have diseases and malformation of our genetic expression happen because of lack of good nutrition. Genes control our body. Sometimes it can be a negative influence but when they are subjected to good nutrition it is positive. When genes are plugged into a harmful environment, they negatively impact our lives. Radiation, chemicals, toxins, and diet are the elements in our environment that impact our genes the most. And this is from a book called Genome by Jerry Bishop and Michael Walters. They are the ones, by the way, that coined the term nutrigenomics. The genetic versus the phenotype. Now this is confusing to a lot of people, but I want to just give you this as a way to understand it. The genotype is the total genetic makeup of our DNA. Okay? 
phenotype the entire physical, biochemical, physiological makeup of an individual. For example, David. When I see David now today, I'm not looking at genotype. I'm looking at phenotype because how he has lived, how he eats, how he treats his body, how he puts sufficient water in to his body daily, and how he puts nutrition in determines his phenotype. And that's what we see. We can't look at a person and see their genotype. And we for years felt the genotype was the bottom line. No, the bottom line of life as we know it is your phenotype. And that involves physical, biochemical, all the toxins we're around, whether we smoke or whether we don't, different things of that nature, and the nutrition make up our physiological makeup of each individual. University of Colorado, Boulder, Barbara Deming Adams. In addition, antioxidants are gene modulators. Now, that's why it's so important to have antioxidants in our body every day. They're gene modulators that turn on and off the appropriate genes that we need. If there's any one thing we have to have to keep us healthy, slow down the aging process, it's antioxidants. There are many possible versions of you in your genes, and I think that's well explained by the difference between genotype and phenotype. See, we have unknown thousands of different genes that we've never seen or know about because we turn on our genes by the way we've lived our lives. Nutrigenomics is altering the expression of one's genes. Nutrigenomics is altering the expression of one's genes. And let me tell you, you get good nutrition, you've got all systems go, so to speak. And that's what will slow down aging. And as a physician, I have seen this happen. I've seen people as spry, you can't believe it, in their 96, 7, 8, 9 years. And it's just amazing. I've eaten with them, taken them to, to lunch to see how they eat, to study them. And it's amazing how they eat. And by the way, one thing that's almost universal, they eat very slowly. Because that's the key to avoid overeating. They eat slowly. It takes about 20 minutes for the satiety that comes from your intestinal tract, that's chemicals that go to your brain and tell you, hey, you're through, you don't need any more food, you're through eating. Now, to study about how this genetic change can come about in a change in individual, here's a good example that I've used many times. Here's monarch caterpillars and butterflies are genetically identical. This is the same genes and have the genes on or off depending the concept of genomics is gene expression. See, this caterpillar has the same identical genes as this butterfly. The difference is gene expression. Look at that and you get the whole picture. Here's how some person would look and here's how another person would look. Myself, I think this is a lot prettier and it's what this was supposed to be. Genetically identical but different in gene expression. This has the same genes but different genes are expressed here as were expressed here. Now, take this to a little higher level in the mouse realm. These two genetically identical mice were born of genetically identical mothers who were fed differently in pregnancy and they will have very different lives. Now here's the concept I want to tell you. How the mother is fed has a big change on the gene expression of the babies. These identical mothers who were fed different amounts of methylate nutrients. Now the B-complex vitamins are methylating. And so can you see the difference here? I certainly hope you can. Uh, the different amounts of methylating nutrients, such as the B-complex vitamin, or soy genestine during pregnancy. They're mothers. Okay? Here's the difference. This yellow mouse, much bigger than this mouse, it's obese, has a high risk of cancer, diabetes, 
obesity, and reduced lifespan. This one will have a third or more decrease in the length of life than this one will. This is called epigenetics, excuse me, epigenetics. The 18th of January, Time Magazine had an article on epigenetics, even on the cover. And some dear sweet friends of mine in Omaha, Nebraska, sent me down after scanning this, sent it down to me, and it was something I really needed at the time. They thought of me, and I thank them dearly for doing that. The maternal supplements with the genestine, zinc, methionine, betanine, choline, folate, and B12 is the difference between these two. Now, this one over here, the agate mouse, has a different color, different body shape. Remember, these are identical genetic. These are even more identical than twins. Lower risk of cancer, diabetes, obesity, and prolonged life. Now, I delivered 2,000 babies in my time, and I think back on it. I insisted that all these ladies pregnant get on the pregnancy vitamins. Some of them didn't want to. Some of them would stop them. But I wish I'd had this slide to show the difference. Good nutrition, poor nutrition. That's gene expression. Everything between these two mice are identical except their risk for cancer, diabetes, obesity, and reduced lifespan. This has a lower risk of cancer, lower risk of diabetes, and obesity. And obesity is the main cause of type 2 diabetes and prolonged life. So that will give you something. Nutrigenomics is a glimpse of the future. Now, let's discuss this. Nutrigenomics or nutrigen, nutritional genomics or nutrigenomics is the study of how foods affect the expression of genetic information in an individual and how an individual's genetic makeup metabolizes and responds to nutrients and bioactives. Bioactives mean different nutritional products like phytochemicals, antioxidants, uh, that kind of thing that we have in our diet. And you know, my mother was right, eat your veggies, Norman. Be sure you can't get up from the table until you eat your veggies. And we had a huge garden, and I ate a lot of them fairly raw, and I thank God now that my mother hammered and hammered on that. I was raised on a farm, and we were self-sufficient. We had all of our own meat. We did our own canning. We had our own garden. That food alters expression of genetic information and the genotype differences result in different metabolic profiles are concepts central to nutritional genomics and indeed provide the critical link between diet and wellness. This is how it all works. This is how nutrition is important in your life. And this is what we have to tell the people who think eating is just something to get full and to be satisfied. No, it's your life. Glycomics is a new area of science closely allied to glycobiology. It's basically a rose and extension of the Human Genome Project in the early 90s in which the structure of our genome contained approximately 100,000 genes. A lot of these genes were considered junk genes. Well, you know, as Ethel Waters says, God didn't make any junk. And they're finding out hundreds of per week of genes that aren't junk but have a function. And it's amazing how genes can transfer and the interaction of genes. It blows your mind when you study how agile the genes are. Dr. Bruce Ames and Stephen Malkopas coined a new term for a new field in 2006 called nutrigenomics. And two dear friends of mine, told me at the time, you've got to study nutrigenomics. I don't know why I said something or thought of something that must have brought that up, but I dearly thank them forever for getting me into this because it's been the most exciting thing of recent years I've ever seen. Meaning of the verb modulate. Well, to explain what modulation is, I use one simple thing. A muffler on your car modulates noise. And what a true modulation as far as your body's concerned 
it elevates the good and decreases the bad. And that's what we're talking about with nutrigenomics. There is an emerging scientific discipline called nutrigenomics or nutritional genomics. The science of nutrigenomics is the study of how naturally occurring chemicals in food alter molecular expression of genetic information in each individual. Now, when you really get a hold of this, this is what it's all about. Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. The challenge of science. Paracelsus. When I was in pharmacy school, I had to read everything he wrote, but I didn't read this. I wasn't shown this. I got a degree in pharmacy and pre-med and then went to medical school. Paracelsus says, all that mankind needs for good health and healing is provided in nature. Now, in his day, they didn't have drugs. They had nothing but herbs and plant growth. That's all I had. When I was in pharmacy school, the dean asked me to be his lab instructor in a field called pharmacognosy. I'll never forget that. And I love that. But you know what that was? That was uh, what we can do for health from plants that we see, like foxglove for digitalis for heart failure. That was just one of the hundreds of them. And I studied that for two years at that time, pharmacognosy, recognizing plants that help people's health. What a, what a blessing it is now to have done that for two years and taught it for two years. One of the main issues in healthcare today is the immune system, whether it be overactive or underactive. I just had a lady call me today who's had an experience from a virus and her immune system has just become inflamed. And so she had swollen joints, painful hands and wrists, and it's a temporary autoimmune problem. So she has to have this reduced, and we set about giving her some counsel about how to do that. The only effective answer that's been found is in the field of nutrition. The immune system is only addressed in the field of nutrition. Traditional medicine does not have anything that will raise your immunity. They have many, many drugs that will lower your immunity. That's what chemotherapy is. That's one thing it'll do. And there's many others. We won't go into the drugs because I'm here tonight to talk about nutrition. The involvement of dietary modification of gene expression is detoxification. That's what detox is. Susceptible to toxin is determined by genetic makeup. Some people can be around toxins and they not bother them that much because they have resistance built in to their genetic makeup, their genotype. Diet has been proven in some studies to modify detoxification ability. You can control the expression of your genetic potential through, one, the foods you eat, or that includes nutrients you eat, the lifestyle you select, whether you get enough sleep or whether you smoke or whether you drink alcoholic beverages or whatever you do, the lifestyle you select, and three, the environment in which you work and live. And everybody varies in all these aspects. That's why some people, when they take nutrients, just unbelievably change just before you. They have a susceptibility for gene expression due to nutrients. The average height Here's a proof of it, of genes and nutrition. The average height of Japanese men and women has increased nearly six inches since World War II. Now think of that. The average height of Japanese men and women have increased nearly six inches since World War II. And the answer is genes have not changed. What has changed is the nutrition of Japanese children. This has been studied and reported on in a big study. This is an example right before our eyes of what happens in nutrition and genes. Nutrients influence gene expression. Unhealthy genes are downregulated or suppressed. Wellness promoting genes are upregulated, benefiting structure and function of our cells. I'm repeating myself because the way to learn and remember is by repetition. They recognize that in general, people do not have the plant molecules needed by our cells to function properly. 
you know, since I w was raised on a farm that we had all of our own food and we raised all of our veggies, and I ate a good percentage of them raw, I can really tell the difference. Now, when I went to college, I didn't have that food, and I was like a, you know, blind dog in a meat house. I was just trying to find something that was fit me and make me feel like I knew I had to eating. I didn't have it because I ain't in restaurants. I ain't processed food. Diet, environment, and lifestyle and exposure to toxic substances affect health status. The original belief that our genes predetermined our health is no longer consistent with present day research. Now you get that in your spirit. The original belief that our genes predetermined our health is no longer consistent with present day research. Receiving the most attention in this area, number one, was cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables, including cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. Now many of you probably don't like any of these. I love them. You know why? Because I eat all of them raw. I've ate every one of those raw. I used to love cabbage. When I went to college and ate some boiled cabbage, I thought this stuff is spoiled. You know, I wasn't used to it. Digestive enzymes from the above promote genetic expression of human detoxification. This is what the ideal detoxifant in your life is. So if you are like one of the presidents who said, I think it was broccoli he didn't like, well, they should have had it because that's a very health-promoting food, and uh, I still eat lots of it. And the enzymes coming from these is what does it to your gene expression. Wellness is having the energy to live life to the fullest. That's a, my definition of wellness, is having the energy to live life to the fullest. How do we get that energy? Nutrition. Wellness is being able to navigate life's stressors with relative ease. You see, if you have enough of these plant chemicals and these antioxidants from nature in your body, you can stand all kinds of life stressors because that's the way we're made. That's the way we're meant to be. And wellness is cellular communication. I could do a whole presentation just on that. It's so important. Now, Here's a man who wasn't a physician, but he was a pretty smart man. If the doctor today does not become the nutritionist of tomorrow, then the nutritionist of today will become the doctor of tomorrow. In 1908, there was a Polish-born biochemist, Kashmir Funk, discovered there were four amino ammonium, these are ammonia-based substances that were vital for life, which he called vital amines. Later, this was shortened to vitamins. Now we have much more than four. But here was the first discovery. And here's also the same year that glycobiology came into being. The first paper ever printed on glycobiology and cellular communication was in 1908, the same time. Then, even though these were found to be vital to the health of the individual, they were not accepted by the Western medical community. And there is still doctors today that say, well, if you want to take vitamins, that's all right. They sure won't hurt you. Now, true, there's a lot of vitamins that aren't that good. But when you take good vitamins in your body, that to me is an essential. Everybody has particularly with the food we're eating these days. Supplements and vitamins are a necessity. Health care crisis today. Over $2 trillion a year spent on U.S. health care. That is more per person than any country in the world. That $2 trillion bought us number 47 in the world in health care. In the world, inability to achieve vital health goals. That's the World Health Organization report in 2008. Not exactly what we would expect. The WHO, the World Health Organization's list of nations in the order of health. The healthiest nation in the world is France. The second healthiest nation in the world is Italy. But we're 47. We've got more care units. We've got more intensive care facilities, vehicles, ambulances, 
we've got a mammoth medical facility and we get 47. Now my personal opinion is we depend too much on drugs. When I was a medical student, cancer was the number eight leading cause of death. It's now number two and occasionally it's number one. It's almost the number one. Eight to two. Why? Because we've ignored nutrition, we've ignored vitamins, as we were just saying. Cause the intake of phytochemicals in fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables makes the difference. Now, of course, we know there's one fruit that France and Italy have a lot of, and that's grapes. And either you can do it as grape juice, which you have to drink about 55 gallon a day to be good and healthy, or you can use resveratrol. And resveratrol is not a company product. There's many, many different companies make this. And I take resveratrol. I take 500 milligrams a day. And I get it from an uh, online uh, mail order nutrition company, mostly found in the grape. There is some other fruits of that size. And, of course, the blue grape is much better than the white grape. But anyhow, that will give you the idea. France is number one healthiest country in the world by World Health Organization. Italy is number two. Now, in 1998, you see, what does absence of necessary nutrients in our diet do? In 1998, WHO declared the U.S. was the 12th healthiest nation in the world. In 2006, World Health Organization reported that the U.S. was the 42nd healthiest nation in the world. Wow, what happened in those years? That's when processed food became at their maximum. Everything in the center of the grocery store is processed. Those on the periphery are natural. That's a good way just to look at the grocery store. And this is when the big upsurgence came. So that left us from 12 to 42, not the right way to go. In 2008, WHO reported the U.S. was 47th healthiest nation in the world. In 1987, the U.S. was listed by WHO as 11th in the world for longevity the 11th country for the people with the longest lifespan. In July of 2007, the U.S. was listed by the World Health Organization as 41 in longevity. That doesn't leave us a good testimony. And look at the top of this slide, absence of necessary nutrients in our diet. Overcompensation, overconsumption and undernutrition causes disease, such as, now get that, overconsumption, eating too much, or undernutrition, which is just as bad, and many times is the same, causes disease such as high blood pressure, strokes, arthritis, all kinds of nervous system disorders, including Alzheimer's, lower immunity, increase in infections, irritable bowel, chronic kidney disorders, adult onset diabetes, and adult onset cancer. This is our biggest crisis right now in these United States. And we just need to realize we have to eat better. Obesity is running us into the grave. Now here's an example. I had many patients say this. I eat healthy, therefore my body is getting what it needs. Here's the customer in the restaurant. Until this mad cow thing passes, I'm staying away from beef. So the kindly waiter says, then may I recommend the mercury-laden fish? with a side of genetically altered corn. And by the way, there's some real astounding literature coming out on genetic modified food. Believe me, you need to look into that. Genetically modified corn, they first modified it, so they put an insecticide in it. That's why now when you take a roasting ear and open it up, there's no worm around the silk. Why? There's an insecticide in the corn. But what does that do when David and I sit down to eat a couple of roasting ears? We get the insecticide in us. That ought to be something to be thought about. In, in last summer, they had their first corn that had insecticide and a herbicide. It not only kills in insects, it weeds itself. But folks, what does that do to us? That's my question. And I like roasting ears, but this kind of kills my appetite a little bit. How do we address the problem? Pharmaceutical companies have started advertising on TV, encouraging people to inquire about their drugs. Ask your doctor 
if so and so is good for me. I know I, I was polled many times by drug companies to say, will that offend you if we start advertising to your patients? It didn't make any difference what I said, they were going to do it. Newsweek is encouraging integrative therapies for wellness. That's good news. Everyone has their own ideas, but one thing is certain, it must be fixed. And, you know, real health care reform, folks, starts in your kitchen. Real health care reform has to start in your kitchen. We need both an integrative and a wellness lifestyle. Now, here's something I really am a promoter of. The insurance companies need to reward people for staying healthy and maintaining wellness as a way of life. Well, reward people for maintaining health, wellness, for being healthy. Now, look at this slide. In 2002, the AMA added dietary supplements to the food pyramid. But I don't know of a doctor that tells his patients, now, you should get a list of supplements and add them to your family's food. Why did the AMA do this? Because they knew our food had lost 85 to 95 percent of the nutrition in it by green harvesting and by food processing. The USDA in 1900 recommended that the American people eat five to seven servings of fresh fruits and veggies. In 1999, the USDA increased their recommendations to tell 10 to 12 servings of fresh fruits and veggies. You see, they doubled it. Why? Because they realized in nine years, the nutrition in your, what you get in the grocery store is almost zip. Almost zip. You get some fiber, but that's the major thing you get. You've got to have supplements. In 1951, two peaches produced a certain amount of beta carotene or vitamin A. In 2002, if you take peaches and test for that same amount, it takes 53 peaches to produce the same amount of beta carotene or vitamin A. 2 in 51, 53 in 2002. Folks, if the nutrients aren't in the soil, they aren't in the product or the produce. They don't get in the produce if it isn't in the soil, the soil that uh, these are grown in. I love this slide. Nothing will benefit human health and increase chances for survival of life on Earth as much as the elevation, elevation to a vegetarian diet. And Albert Einstein became a vegetarian in his latter years. I'm not promoting people be veggies or vegans, be vegetarians. But I'm saying we need to eat less meat and more fresh fruits and vegetables. Just think of that. He wasn't a doctor, but he was a pretty smart man, and we're going to all get around to it because we all are going to find out the only way to remain healthy and active. And see, rather than putting life in our years, what I'm promoting will put years, more life into you, more activity. Instead of just years in your life, you don't want that. We have those in nursing homes. We want life in our years. Attacked on healthy cells, is there a better solution? Free radical attack cells, stress, toxins, drugs, lifestyles, environment. 10,000 hits per day per cell on DNA. Damaged DNA mutates cells. And what does mutated cells produce? Malignancies. That's why, you know, cancer was the eighth leading cause of death when I was a senior. It's now two or one, depending on which time of the year you check the statistics. Viruses and bacteria attacks, immune system compromised by these attacks, abnormal processes flourish, systems are expressed, cellular disruption follows, wellness, is recti and wellness rectification is required. There's actually, when these cells mutate, when they start to become a malignancy, they put out a chemical that protects them from your macrophages and your defenses. That cancer protects itself in your body. So that's why this is so important that we change our lifestyle and our eating and nutrition. Antioxidants and lifespan. This is a world map of people, years, 100 years lifespan. 
These are called the blue zones. And if you want to read about them, I did a presentation on the blue zones. I did several presentations on the blue zones. What do these people live who routinely live past 100? And a lot of them lived to be 110 with their teeth they were raised with, their normal teeth, don't wear glasses, live 110. One lady lived, I have a picture of a lady that's 152 years old, proven. Now, that was in National Geographic and research, believe me. Why are we having so much disease? One is corporate farming. Two is green harvesting. Three is food processing. What's green harvesting? We get most of our produce from the San Joaquin Valley in California. A lady from there called me once and asked me some questions about nutrition. And I said, before I tell you this, I want to find out how do you pick your tomatoes? She said, how do you think we pick our tomatoes? I said, I think you pick them green, put them in bags, send them to Kansas City, where I live. The Gershman gasses them with ethylene gas. They turn red and they put them out to, on the shelf to sell. She said, no, we quit doing that a long time ago. We now gas them and pack them. We pick them 10 days before they change color. We put them in big plastic sacks and fill that with tomatoes and then fill it with ethylene gas and seal it. In four hours, every tomato in there is bright red. We ship them to Kansas City. Now, they look wonderful, but they're harder than a rock. You couldn't dent one of those tomatoes with a hammer. Now, the bad news is the nutrition from a tomato comes in the last 72 hours on the vine. That's the nutrition comes in. So, therefore, all these tomatoes have no nutrition in them. And I think most everybody that hears me tonight can tell there's been a change in the taste of our tomatoes. Now, here's what you need to do. When you look at your tomatoes in the store, you see they're all laying in a row and they're all the same. Ripe tomatoes will rupture, they will lobulate, and they're uneven, and no two tomatoes look the same. You go to farmer's market and look at them. However, some of those are picked green now. They're all different. Now, here's the way to test them. When you go to buy tomatoes, look and look for bug spots. And here's what you want to remember. If the bugs won't eat them, you shouldn't eat them. The bugs don't go in color. They know what's ripe and what isn't. In Canada, health care costs, there's some controversy about my statistics here, but anyhow, health care costs are high in, in spending in Ontario, Canada. And as you can see in this slide, these figures are unsustainable. And we have people here in the United States that feel we should have government health care. We need to start focusing on wellness. And as I said, health care reform begins in the kitchen. Statistics. 90% of every food dollar is spent on processed food. By the way, processed food has no nutrition. Obesity costs are now greater than smoking, $240 billion a year. Seven billion pounds of toxins are released into the environment each year. Health care costs for auto workers adds approximately $2,000 to the price of every vehicle. I love this slide. Identifying part of the problem. This is from the USDA Health Freedom Resources, Inc. Over an 80-year period, 1900 to 1980. Poultry consumption increased 350% during that 80 years. Fresh apple consumption decreased 70%. Fresh fruit consumption decreased 33%. Fat and oil consumption increased 150%. Now this is oil that you, that you cook with. These are cheap vegetable oils, and that isn't what you need to have to cook with. My opinion, right here, I'll give it to you, cook with olive oil. Margarine consumption increased 800%. Margarine is vegetable fats put together. It was made to be a lubricant, but it turned out to be too hard to be a lubricant, so they colored it yellow and uh, started having us eat it. So, folks, if you run out of margarine, 
you'll get some axle grease because that was what margarine was supposed to be like. Corn syrup consumption increased 400%. Sugar consumption increased 50%. Cheese consumption and its fat increased 400%. Soft drink consumption increased 300%. Each person consumes 38 gallons of soft drink per year, 20% of our sugar intake. Now, there is people that don't have that much, but that's on an average according to USDA. Americans eat an estimated, seven, estimated 75 acres of pizza a day. Americans eat an estimated 75 acres of pizza per day. Now, here's somebody that's getting into the veggies like I'm promoting tonight. But, so this is a question. Here's the kindly doctor. It's good that you're eating more fresh fruits and vegetables, but be careful to chew more thoroughly. You see, the, he's got some protrudence here that uh, he really shouldn't have. Now, some bald-headed people may think this is pretty good because they got something growing there. Is there a better solution? Yes. Defend, protect, and restore. Defend your cells and your body. Defend your good genes. Protect your good genes and keep them functioning and restore those that aren't functioning properly. The operating systems of the body, the human body. The subsystems include the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, the endocrine system, the immune system, and the digestive system. The software for all of the body systems is cell-to-cell -cell communication, which is phytochemicals that we get from fresh fruits and veggies or supplement. And that's the software for your whole mechanism of cell-to-cell -cell communication, which turns those switches on the good genes and down the bad genes. It is our responsibility to take care for the operating systems of our bodies and to keep them functioning in the manner they were meant to function. This is life support, folks, you can eat. Life support you can eat. It is one of the most important deposits you can make. Sure, supplements may be expensive, but it's the best investment you can ever make. Deposit daily into your health account. I've had people say, when I've told them different nutrients that they need to take to really be healthy and, and slow their aging and live a better functional life, oh, but Doc, it's so expensive. And I always tell them in a kindly way, but it's not near as expensive as a casket. When you get it in that term, maybe it's a little easier to see. We've been eating non-nutritious food, and it's we're going to have to pay the price by buying different supplements to make us healthy. I love this song, too, from Einstein. The mind that opens to a new idea never comes back to its original size. Folks, if you've concentrated tonight on seeing what you can do with your genes and your genetic makeup and how you can change your life, your mind will never go back the way it was two hours ago because you know there's more you can do to preserve your life, slow down your aging, put more life in your ear, years rather than years in your life. It's time to face the truth or suffer the consequences. I've tried to give you the truth tonight, diligently. Now, I'm going to give you some summary on dietary recommendations. Number one, I believe the most crucial thing that we have before us is controlling insulin and blood sugar in our bodies. We do that by balancing the, in, the intake of carbohydrates and dietary lean protein and dietary fiber. Balancing it. I'm not saying that this is a diet it's a balance. You've got to balance the insulin and blood sugar. Here's what happens. When you have a heavy carbohydrate meal or you eat a piece of pecan pie alamode or something of that nature that's really good, eh? some ice cream on a couple of brownies, that blood sugar, that goes into your blood forming elevated blood sugar. That releases excess insulin. And insulin 
well, take that out of your blood sugar because it's toxic in your blood. And where does it put it? It stores it on your hips, where you sit down, on your thighs, on your abdomen. It makes visceral fat, toxic fat. And that we can't have because that is hazardous to your health. So concentrate on this. Control the insulin and blood sugar. Balance the carbohydrate, the protein, and the fat in every meal. This, there's, there's three main things that we got to do with this. And that is we've got to control the insulin, control the carbohydrates, and increase fish oils in our diet. Okay, let's go on here. Control the levels of carbohydrates, including sugars in diet, with increased consumption of lean protein and dietary fiber. Reduce levels of saturated fats. Use monounsaturated fats. Fats that are healthy for you, like fish oils and fish. Increase intake of vitamin E, chromium, vanadium, magnesium, and omega-3 fish oil. Believe me, there's a hormone release when you have a higher percentage of carbohydrates and your blood sugar goes up and your insulin goes up. They're called eicosanoids. And they're, there's good eicosanoids and there's bad eicosanoids. Now, if you do slip up, the fish oil will help a little bit in getting rid of bad eicosanoids. But it's not something you want to depend on. You've got to do the decision making. And this isn't hard to do, folks. I have all kinds of literature on this. And there's books you can purchase that will tell you exactly how. To. I have a book that I carry with me when I travel. And it's called What to Eat When You Control Your Insulin and Your Blood Sugar. We keep them in a safe zone. The insulin's in a safe zone, a safety zone, where it isn't our enemy. It can be our best friend. Okay, I carry that little book with me whenever I leave home because it tells me in every restaurant that I go in what I can eat to help me control my insulin and blood sugar excreted my, from my pancreas. So this is it. Number one, control of insulin and blood sugar, and you've read the following. Reduce inflammation. Inflammation is the cause of the ten top cause of death in this country. Inflammation is our biggest enemy and inflammation is perpetuated if you don't do what I just showed you about controlling your blood sugar and your insulin. Here's reduced inflammation. Limit dairy products and wheat grains. Increase soy if you're not allergic to it. I am so sick of doctors telling people do not eat any soy. Oh, we can't have you eat soy. Well, the Chinese have been treating malignancies for 3,000 years with soy. What do you think of that? Eat more legumes, flax and rye. Nutritional supplements, niacin, glucosamine, and L-glutamine. Increase fish oil. Now, you'll notice I'm a heavy pusher of fish oil. Folks, if I had only one thing to tell you to do tonight to help your genetic makeup, it's eat fish and fish oil. I, I depend on that, and I've seen absolute unbelievable things happen. Omega-3 fish oil, depending on your health, from 5 to 7.5 grams per day. Now, you may think that's a little much, but I believe that sometimes it's a little light. So at least this much. Primarily for maintenance and slowing aging and getting rid of obvious inflammation. See, there's two types of inflammation. There's those that are, you're aware of. That's when you put a, get a splinter under your fingernail and go to sleep tonight. In the morning, you're going to know about that splinter because it's going to throb with every heartbeat. That's, I call it, overt inflammation. When you're gaining a big tummy and your belt, you have to punch some more holes in your belt, that's silent inflammation. And that is toxic to your body. Okay? So here's reduce inflammation. 
reduce the risk of heart disease. Heart disease and stroke are the number one killer most of the time. Cancer takes over that spot occasionally. Reduce risk of heart disease. Eat a diet low in saturated fat and high in dietary fiber. Increase intakes of fish and fish oil. Let me just stop here. You may think I'm really pushing fish oil, and I am. When I was a senior medical student, I had to write a thesis. And I wrote it on heart disease in young adult males 19 through 35. It fascinated me. Because the Korean War showed amazing amounts of 18, 19-year-old men with a fairly advanced coronary artery disease and autopsy. So I was doing research on writing this thesis, and I discovered Eskimos in Greenland didn't have heart disease, didn't have heart attacks, they didn't have strokes, they didn't have cancer, they didn't have arthritis, they didn't have autoimmune disease. Now, by the American Heart Association, they all should have been dead. What do they live on? fat, but they live on good fat. They live on whale fat, fish fat, and it's in cold water. When you get omega-3, you want to get it from cold water fish, mackerel, etc., uh, different fish that uh, grow in cold water, halibut, salmon, etc. They don't have these diseases. Now, there's some reason. And I got to study in this. This is 56 years ago. And I thought, wow, how did they get by with it? Well, it didn't tumble on what the real situation was. Same with Japan. Now, when Japanese come over to this country, within the end of one year living on our diet, if they totally convert to our diet, some of my Japanese friends don't. They still buy Japanese groceries. If they convert entirely to our diet, it takes one year for them to fall in the same risk for coronary heart disease as we have. Does that tell you something about the need of fish oil? Increased intake of fish and fish oil, omega-3, vitamin E, selenium, magnesium, vitamin B6, folic acid, and vitamin B12, vitamin C, Q, CoQ10, and L-arginine. And I believe there's been a presenter here building strength webinars that uh, twice I believe he's presented the value of L-arginine in heart disease. But anyhow, I just wanted to explain that with the fish oil. Reduce brain aging, okay? Reduce inflammation. That's the biggie, and you'll hear me talk about that every time you talk to me. Eat more veggies that improve detoxification, including cruciferous vegetables. We've covered that. Broccoli. Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, and soy products. Supplement with vitamin E, alpha lipoic acid, vitamin C, CoQ10, N-acetylcysteine, zinc, and copper. Prescription grade omega-3, 5 to 7.5 grams. And there's a man named Dan Ward down in Crystal Lake, Florida that has a nursing facility, and I don't know what is going on now down there, but I read a testimony of the, from there. It's River Oaks Extended Care and Rehab, and he started controlling the insulin and the blood sugar on every Alzheimer's patient he got. And he got the ones that had been kicked out of most nursing homes because of behavior. They were advanced. And he started as much as 25 grams a day of fish oil. But the results he got was unbelievable. And I've read this and read this and read this. It just rings out at me every time I think of somebody, a friend of mine that has Alzheimer's. I tell the loved ones, be sure and get them on fish oil. Now, you may, depending on the level of their brain aging with Alzheimer's, need more than 7.5 grams, but under a doctor's care or consultation with people who know, uh, you know, that you can discover. And uh, there's a doctor back near Boston named Barry Sears who uh, has done research for 30 years on controlling blood sugar and 
your insulin levels, and he promotes uh, omega-3 and would be glad to uh, share literature. You can get his website, drsears.com, drsears.com, or zoneliving.com. Uh, any of those websites, you'll see them when you pull up Dr. Sears. Anyhow, on to Google. But here is a reduction of brain aging. And all of us want to think better. I mean, from nothing else, uh, we can be with our families longer, stay out of nursing homes. And a lot of these people that he had given this high dose omega-3 were back with their families. They didn't go to another nursing home. They went back to their families. Okay, the last one, summary, is reduced cancer risk. Increased consumption of detoxification such from foods such as soy products, green tea, or have you ever heard of olive leaf tea? A lot of people are using that for its detoxification principles, antioxidants, cruciferous vegetables, again we mentioned that, dietary fiber, spices like curcumin. Curcumin is well known in India for its ability to promote health and lessen infection, I mean inflammation. And then garlic. Garlic is always good, healthy. Eat more fruits like grapes and grape juice, and we covered that. Fish oil, omega, Rx grade omega-3, vitamin B12, folic acid, and vitamin B6. And this is the methylation we talked about on the epigenetics before. And so you need those vitamins. Now, I'm getting to the end of this. The end is your beginning. And it means health reform starts in the kitchen. We can't depend on other people giving us health reform. We have to reform our own each health, each one of our healths, by the way we eat. And there's no way can we live like we've been living and eating. So much fast food. I have to tell people that's fast to the grave. But fast food, processed food, green harvest food, we have to stop consuming so much of that. We have to control things. As somebody that I really admire said, we have to eat food that was here 10,000 years ago, vegetation, fruits and vegetables. And I like this. If it grows in the ground, it's a vegetable or fruit. If it moves around, it's protein, it's an animal. We need less that move around and more that grow in the ground. As simple as that. You know, if you look at your dog's teeth, You'll see he has tearing teeth. He's a carnivore. He eats meat. You look at a tiger. Look at their teeth. They're similar. They're carnivores. Look at your teeth. And if you're getting to my age and I don't have false teeth, you can take them out and look at them. But I don't uh, recommend that. Anyhow, your teeth are made as grinding. If your teeth looks like your dog, you got a problem. But normally, our teeth are for grinding. What do we grind? Fruits and vegetables. So that's my admonition. Control the amount of insulin secreted by controlling the balance between the protein and the carbohydrate. For example, say a male needs 100 grams of protein a day. And by the way, that's the size of the palm of your hand, excluding your fingers and thumbs. Your palm that thick and that big around, okay? If you need 100 grams of protein as a male a day, you should have about 140 grams of carbohydrate and no more. Fat, about 60 grams. That gives you a 1,500 calorie diet. And <clears throat> that's the big thing that's needed, the big thing. And I'll go over this again. Follow an eating plan of balancing your protein and carbohydrate and fat. Grains and starches use in only moderation. Your fat should be monounsaturated fat and low-fat protein. Fruits 
and veggies, vine ripened, high dose fish oil, most people don't take near enough. A person I admire said one day, most people take placebo amounts of omega-3. You need to take plenty of it. Now just to give you some statistics on heart disease, there's a GISA study, G-I-S-S-I -S -S -I study, you can Google that, showed the effects of reducing inflammation with high-dose fish oil. Overall mortality dropped 20 percent. Cardiovascular mortality, mortality dropped 30 percent. Sudden death mortality dropped 45 percent. So that will give you an idea of what we're really shooting for in nutrigenomics. Don't forget the fish and the fish oil. You see, you've got to get a good quality fish oil that's molecularly distilled. And one of the best tests, if you buy the oil, which I dearly love, and my wife gets sick every time she sees me taking a tablespoonful of omega-3 oil, if you take that, put it in your refrigerator and do what's called the toothpick test. S put it in there overnight, and the next day when you take it out, put a toothpick in it. If the toothpick stands up, you've got poor fish oil. If the toothpick falls down, you've got good fish oil, because pure fish oil won't freeze. It doesn't even get thick. Mine, you can't tell it. I, I take it out of my freezer to get a delicious spoonful of that, and uh, you can't tell it's even been in the refrigerator. Well, I think it's time for any questions, David. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Marvin. This has been extremely informative. I'm going to uh, just take the control back for a few minutes. Folks, sure. if you have any questions, if you have any questions, please type them in to the chat box to your right. And uh, we'll hand, hand it back to Dr. Marvin in a second or so. Well, more like a minute or so. Like, okay. Oops. Hold on. Okay. Uh, this has been Dr. Marvin. And I'm going to be putting this picture up. Uh, the video recordings of this presentation, uh, uh, this presentation as well as others, will be uh, available on, on our site. Again, they're free for members. Someone asked about the slides, the slides themselves. Yes, the slide and the handouts of, of the images of the slides will be available, but not the slides themselves. And again, you can get that from our site in a couple of days, I believe. Um, Mark Waldman will be up tomorrow uh, to speak about compassion, communication, and your brain. He, along with Dr. Newberg, are the top two researchers in, in brain researchers in the field of spirituality and how, the, and how that affects your brain. Very, very good stuff he has to share. I'll be speaking on Thursday. And uh, again, Jackie's presentation is available on our site as well. Dr. Marvin, this has been, I, I, this has been, uh, I don't know how, how to put it, but this has been as complete and comprehensive a view of, of nutrition as, as, as is possible. If, if, I don't know if, we, if one can improve on this. Thank you so, so much. It's my pleasure, David. I don't see any questions. Evidently, the people are all asleep. Or oh, uh, I'm sure there are, right, Sherry? Yes, there's a, there's a few questions coming in. Yes. Yeah, they, oh, good. They are, they're going to keep coming in as well. Uh, but I'm going to ask my question first before we, we, get, we get swamped. Uh, so, We've mentioned everything from fatty acids to glyc glyconutrients to phytochemicals and phytonutrients. I'm, I'm going to be speaking at a retirement home in a couple of days, and I'm just going to be thinking about what, what, what would be the uh, some good rule, a rule of thumb to go by. And I was thinking, if you were to mention your number one, if, if the person was were to choose one nutrient, I don't want to put you on the spot. If you're not comfortable answering it, that's fine. But if you were to mention, if you were to choose one nutrient, let's say this person doesn't have much money, what would you point to as the one they absolutely can, should not do without? Okay, 
That's really easy, David, and I tell a lot of people this. Number one, it costs very little to balance your carbohydrates in the safe zone with your insulin output. That's just how you eat. You okay. eat less carbohydrates than most people eat and eat more lean meat to balance it at that time. And you shouldn't go over five hours without food. And if you have to take a snack, that's available, and I could explain that to them. Usually three meals and two snacks will keep anybody from ever being hungry again while they're losing weight. I went on this regime, David, and lost 26 pounds so quick I thought my belts were stretching because, you know, I had to keep tightening them up instead of letting them out. It just zip went. So what I would do is have them control their carbohydrate, protein, and their fats and have it monounsaturated. And by the way, I didn't mention it, but when you buy omega-3, get omega-3, not omega-3, 6, and 9. We get too much omega-6 in our diet as it is from processed food. And 9 is the same as olive oil. So just get omega-3. But that would be the other thing. People of that age need omega-3 desperately, in my opinion. It's brain food mm -hmm. in general. It is an inflammatory food. They need omega-3. So that, they need that would be, would that be the number one uh, nutritional supplements you would, you would yes. do? It? Yes. I'm just saying if you want to do the most good for most people in a nursing home, put them on the control of their insulin output by the safe zone of how much carbohydrate and protein. That, that determines how your insulin secretion is. And then just give them omega-3. One doesn't cost them anything. The other one isn't very expensive. Omega-3 is not a real expensive. For the good it does, it's wonderful. Right, right, right. I've told my family, when I quit making sense, pour omega-3 down me. <laughs> right. Well, didn't Dr. Uh, Sears talk about the, the person who had uh, severe toxic exposure? Uh, yes, the man in that mine. In mine. Right, right. And yeah, he was, he was considered a vegetable. Mm -hmm. He had brain failure, heart failure, liver failure, all systems practically failure. And nobody really knows what the outcome was. And I wouldn't know unless Dr. Sears had told me. And this guy's back functioning. He and his wife have had two kids since then. Mm -hmm. He looks fit as a fiddle on the pictures I've seen of him. And how did he do it? High dose omega-3. Restored his brain. Mm. Folks, take home that message, omega-3. It's important. That's amazing. That's amazing. All right, Sherry, you want to go ahead and ask the questions? Okay. One of them is, what about hydroponic-grown tomatoes? Yeah. The hydroponic tomatoes are wonderful as long as they're picked right. They're wonderful because they actually are perfect from this aspect. They're grown in a fluid without soil, but the fluid has all the nutrients put in it that they need. And because they're inside in a vat as they're grown, then they don't have any dissipation of the nutrients in that fluid other than in the tomato. My daughter in western Kansas gets her tomatoes that she doesn't grow. She gets tomatoes from hydroponics. There's a farmer who quit farming wheat and has started doing hydroponics in a Quonset uh, building. And he's doing cucumbers and tomatoes now and getting along wonderfully. That's where the plant is submerged. The roots are submerged in this fluid. They're suspended on a string from something above them. And they are, that's how they grow and that's how they produce their fruit. And they're perfect for nutrition. Yes, they're wonderful because they're all picked, fine, ripened. Mm, okay, good. And I just have to tell you, there's lots of people who have typed in, excellent, excellent, this is wonderful, fantastic information. And um, one person even says, I love this. It makes me hyperventilate. It makes so much <laughs> sense. <laughs> and this science saved my life. So I love that comment. Thank you, Bernie. Well, thank <laughs> you so much, whoever that was. You're so kind. And uh, here's a question. 
Um, once a child is born with a genetic defect, um, like Downs or something, can nutrients help change the course of that genetic expression? Absolutely. There's 37 that I know of Down syndromes who are functioning as biosomy 21. Most of them are in England, but there's one that's a good friend of mine here in the United States. I have a friend whose daughter was born trisomy 21. That's not a disease, folks. That's a mal-expression of genes. And that person is a junior in college. Does that say something? Mm. I, I know the person very well. I've stayed in their home. I've talked to them, talked their leg off about all the stuff they did nutritionally. So, yes, that's absolutely true. Okay. Let's see. Here's another one. Um, if we increase omega-3 fish oil substantially, do we need to offset it with increased antioxidants? I don't really think you do, but if you eat cruciferous vegetables or take antioxidants into your system, you'll normally do that. And I promoted that tonight on everything I mentioned. I mentioned natural antioxidants. I mentioned supplement antioxidants. Yes, you don't have to worry about it. But if you do immediately start in real high levels, you should have some direction by either a naturopathic physician or an MD or a DO that knows something about nutrition. Okay. Um, you had mentioned a study about omega-3. Somebody's asking, what was that study again? Oh, uh, I think you were talking about if I'm not right, about the nursing home down in Florida? I um, assume that's what they're talking about. Yeah, I'm, if, if that's not, then maybe type it in again and we'll ask it again. Yeah. Um, that was done in a nursing home with a lot of Alzheimer's patients. And they used quite a high dose. They used up to 25 grams. But uh, uh, I have read other accounts that 15 grams and 12 and a half grams have, they've seen results with. Uh, you know, the whole key is <clears throat> there's many scientists that believe that man's big boost in intelligence came about in near the Aldari Gorge in Africa. And they were about to starve to death because all their food, they had a famine in the land. And uh, their fish they were eating, crawfish and crabs, they didn't have, they all disappeared because everybody was eating them. And then they decided there was algae. So they scraped the algae off and eat it. Algae is what produces omega-3. The reason we get it from fish oil, fish eat the algae. And store it up and concentrate it in the fat level of their bodies. And why do they do that? Because they have a lot of fat. This is cold water fish. They have fat because it's a warming keep their body warm. And therefore, that's where we get the omega-3 from fish, mm. algae. And that's what many researchers believe expanded intelligence. Because the DHA in the fish oil, there's e DHA and EPA, the DHA is brain food. A good percentage of her brain is DHA. And this feeds it. And as we get older, and eating like we have, and that's why we've got an epidemic of Alzheimer's. There isn't grandmas around to poke down cod liver oil to everybody. Mm -hmm. When I used to go see my grandmother, she'd take one look at me and say, Norman, I think you need some cod liver oil. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter what I look like, I'd fix my hair, I'd take a bath, I'd wash my face in hopes that I'd look better, that I wouldn't have to take that awful stuff. <laughs> and here would come the spoon of cod liver oil every time I saw my grandmother. In fact, sometimes I'd stay outside and not even go inside and play around with my granddad because he didn't poke cod liver oil down my <laughs> belly. But right. it was healthy, and it was good. But now we got better. We got omega-3. Right. Um, how long do we freeze the fish oil to check it? Oh, overnight. Overnight, okay. Usually, yeah. Just put it in your freezer and let it stay maybe a day if you want it, and that will check to see if you have the real McCoy and, and did the you, quality. If, you had mentioned a Swedish study. Did you give the website for that? Oh, yes. 
Uh, I don't think I did. Let me see. I've probably got it here. I'll have to look it up. I tell you, if you want to, they could email me. And uh, I'll tell you if I can't find or, it. Or even if you send it to us, we could put it on our website or okay. put it okay. in the thank you for attending email or something. We'll, yeah, we'll right. get it to you. Okay. This is an interesting question. Is there any evidence emerging that specific nutrients affect specific genes? To my knowledge, they don't. They are more general. I would say probably specific nutrients might be better for brain, just like, you know, we talked about the omega-3. But as far as the others, uh, it's a, see, many, many diseases, like heart disease, there may be 12, 13 genes that fire to develop vascular and heart disease. Not just one gene. Mm. Downs is one gene. Huntington's is one gene. And many, many more. You know, it's just one gene. Uh, hemochromatosis, one gene. But many of these others, like pulmonary emphysema, that's more than one gene. And uh, so that has to be in generalities to build up your immunity in cases where you need it and bring it down in autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So, no, there's, there's uh, no real good evidence of one specific nutrient. I think the way where bodies are made by God was that it would be generalities. If we'd eat right, we would function the way he intended to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's one. I'm not sure I completely understand it, but I'll, I'll just read it as it's written. It says, uh, too many raw uh, cruciferous vegetables are, I'm not sure how to say this word, goitrogenic, uh, since they <laughs> bind iodine, and so many have low thyroid today, should we lightly cook some to achieve a balance? Yes, you can do that, and I know what they're talking about. Okay. Goitrogenic, you did a wonderful pronouncing it. That produces goiters enlargement of the thyroid. And here's my big problem. Ever since Arthur Herschler discovered the cause of goiters was a lack of iodine, he was from Her Halstead, Kansas. And uh, I got to see him, by the way, before he died. Anyhow, we need to make sure we have enough iodine. And you get a lot of iodine and nutrients, and, and you should. There's a lot of different things that have iodine in it. Seafood, all has iodine in it. Eat more fish, you know. Seafood has iodine in it. A lot of people can't eat crustacean. That's, you know, uh, shrimp and and clams and lobsters and that because of the iodine content. But mm -hmm. iodized salt was made strictly by the recommendations of to my knowledge, the people doing research in goitrogenic effects of vegetables. So that should be overbalanced. Okay. I think everybody should have enough if they're eating healthy and eating some salt with iodine in it. And eating about, you know, two or three servings of fish a week. You should do that. You know, in Bible times, that's the main meat they had. Mm -hmm. They didn't eat lambs except at Passover. But Dr. Marvin, we need to qualify kind of fish we we recommend that they eat, though, because of the trouble with all the mercury and the. the oh yes. Products. Well, yeah. sure. You need to do that. The same thing, mercury and cadmium, is in fish oils. That's why I said earlier it has to be molecularly distilled to get rid of that. As Dr. Sears says, and quoting him again, the sewer of the sea is fish. You know, they're bottom feeders, a lot of them. And it's, you know, we're at the top of the food chain, and they're at the bottom. So there's a lot of potential in that. But, of course, you know, don't use farm fish in general, as been, I've been told. And when I was going to Harvard every year for their medical updates, they were making their own omega-3. They told me they had to get 400 miles offshore to get away from mercury contamination. Hmm. Wow. 400 miles. 
Hmm. You uh, mentioned green harvesting. Are frozen mm -hmm. foods apt to be picked more often ripe than fresh foods? Absolutely, and whoever did that knows something that everybody should know. <laughs> you can't freeze veggies and fruit unless it's ripe. Mm. It won't stay. <laughs> and I've seen it happen. Well, you can see it happen. Plant something too early in the spring and get it froze and see what it looks like. It has to be ripe before you can freeze it and maintain the the uh, taste and quality that you want in a frozen food. Absolutely, the person's 100% right. Mm -hmm. Frozen yes. veggies for frozen food are much better. Hey, Doc, has an interesting question. Is it, is it possible to take more antioxidants than is healthy? No, there's a matter of diminishing returns. They've done this by auric levels. And what happens as you increase your antioxidants, like you take a certain amount and you double it and you get twice the auric level, then you double that and you get maybe a third more. You double that and maybe you get a sixth more. There's a law of diminishing returns. That's because your body's made so. It doesn't do that. You don't ever, in my opinion, get too much antioxidant. Your body nullifies it. So um, it is, you can't overdose. In other words, you just don't get all that much benefit. Yeah, you, uh, be yeah like if you're taking an antioxidant, you're taking two capsules a day, fine. Uh -huh. And if you feel you've uh, got a, a threat to you by different toxins and you want to take four a day, fine. And then you take six a day, and then you get to eight a day. Well, you're losing from six on, probably, maybe four on. You're losing a lot of what you put into the antioxidants. You're losing money for the effect you're getting. Okay. I call it the law of diminishing return. Okay. All right, from the same person, naturally he's a, nat he's a naturopath, uh, can a person take too much of a supplement like this when it is in a concentrated form? I don't know what he's referring to when he says like this, but... I don't know what would be concentrated form. I know I have calls on people who are taking concentrated nutrients, and I always tell them to dilute them. Hey, David, it's in the question right above it. Oh, is it? Could you read it out? Uh, it says there's a coffee berry supplement that they've been oh. using, and its ORAC value is around uh, 1,100. And they're wondering oh. if a person can take too much of a supplement like that that's in a concentrated form. Oh, I suppose you could, but uh, I really uh, doubt it. The supplement that I have used for years is about 1,700 auric points, and uh, I've given twice the recommended amount of that without any problems. I think your body protects you. <laughs> but again, I think you'd have quicker absorption if you dilute those. Mm. You know, there is a good thing to think about in concentrated nutrients of dilution because you've, there's certain cells in your body that absorb them, most nutrients. And so if you dilute it out, you're going to have, the time is going to increase that it's in front of those cells. You know, like for example, there's some things that are absorbed in the jejunum, some in the duodenum. Well, if you have a concentrated, it's going to go through the duodenum in a very concentrated fashion. Unless you're drinking a lot of water with it, which is dilution. But if you dilute it to start with, it's going to slow down the passage past a lot of those cells that are going to absorb it because you make it a bigger area for absorption. Mm. Does okay. exercise affect your genes? Yes, exercise does because it gives you different circulations in your cells. Just like drinking water. You should have 64 ounces of water a day because you have to have things fluid enough that your body can attach to it. Our body is 70% water. At my age, probably 60%. But anyhow, a younger person, you need to have much more water. I have to have plenty of water. You see, in older people, 
35%, they claim, of older people over 50 go around semi-dehydrated every day. That slows down your thinking. It slows down your functioning of your physiology. And therefore, when you get up to a certain age like 75 or above, many people mistake thirst for hunger, which just makes their dehydration more because they eat more food instead of, you know, mm -hmm. drinking water. And that's, right. that's one of the big things. I know of people that have made a complete turnaround in their health by adding water. Mm. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And wow. it works. Wow. Well, uh, someone was asking about, uh, you mentioned the nursing home. Uh, where can I read about this nursing home story, ETC? Well, I can tell you where I read about it. I read about it in Dr. Sears. Omega RX Zone, a book. And you can get that in Barnes & Noble, or you can go online and get it from Dr. Sears, in drsears.com. Omega RX Zone. And if you really are interested in, in the Omega-3 use, you should read it anyhow. It's one of my best books. I love to read that. In fact, I've got a paperback where I can carry it around. I've got a hardback that I can read at night before I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. oh, and I that's in there. Speaking if you want to know the page, if they want to know the page, let me give it to them. Okay. It's page 108. Page 108 in Omega RX Zone book by Dr. Barry Sears. You can get it on Google, you can get it on Barnes & Noble, you can get it on drsayers.com. Hmm. Great. And speaking about omega-3s, uh, someone asked if you could please repeat uh, how to test omega-3 for quality. <laughs> okay, what you do, you pour it out in a little saucer. Uh, I would, as, you know, a small one, like a medicine cup, so you have some depth and put it in your freeze, freezer, say 24 hours if you want a time. Take it out in 24 hours and put a toothpick in it. If the toothpick stands up, it means the oil has, has a firm body. Good, pure omega-3, it just falls over because the freezing didn't affect it. That's the test of good omega-3. Okay, uh, someone says, could you please repeat the quote about doctors and nutrition? Was that the Thomas Edison quote? I don't know. Oh, oh I think he said if the doctors, um, this may be it, if the doctors of today aren't the nutritionists, the nutritionists of today will be the doctors of tomorrow. Interesting. In other words, that's what's going to happen because our drugs are becoming more toxic, more side effects. Look at it, folks. We have the most drugs available in the world, and we're 47th healthiest nation. That ought to be a message to everybody. Right. Here's my quote. You want to quote me. It's not healthier living through chemistry. It's healthier living through nutrition. We weren't made to eat rocks. We weren't made to drink chemicals. We're made to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, vine rapid, and fish or fish oil. Someone asked a question about uh, vitamin D. Uh, he, he noticed you didn't mention vitamin D, and there's appears to be a lot of research about vitamin D and its efficacy. I'm 100 percent, and I take 4,000 units a day. I didn't specifically put it in there because there's various kinds of vitamin D, and I like to talk about vitamin D when I really recommend it, and I didn't feel I had time 
to put it in is it's very important. In fact, the research I'm recently reading shows me probably vitamin D is more important than vitamin E. If you take omega-3, you probably don't need as much vitamin E. But everybody needs vitamin D. It has all types of health parameters. And you can just Google vitamin D and see all the different things you'll get. Uh, all these parameters that I gave you, healthy aging, cancer prevention, heart disease prevention, all of those, every one of them should have vitamin D. I've gone to all kinds of seminars on vitamin D. In fact, women who have osteopenia, which is the starting of osteoporosis, need vitamin D3 with their calcium, or they won't absorb as much. Right. And you, they did a research here at the University of Kansas. I'll just tell people this that are still listening. I guess there's a few still on. Here's the thing. They did a research at KU Medical Center on the best calcium there was on the market. They went from the most expensive, the injection type, clear every other type they could find. This was a big study done at KU Med Center. I heard it presented. Bottom line, Caltrate, C-A-L-T-R-A-T-E, which has calcium and D3 together. You can buy it at Costco. You can buy it at Sam's. You can buy it very economically. And I tell everybody that I talk to that asks anything about osteopenia or osteoporosis, get Caltrate and take two a day. Men, at least one a day. In addition to vitamin D. Right. It's in it. It's in the pill. Oh, so it's a combination of calcium and vitamin D. Yeah, right. And oh, that's awesome. what makes it so good. And, you know, we need the vitamin D uh, you know, for the absorption of the calcium. That's that's the good part. Mm -hmm. Right. And the caltrate is 600 of calcium and D. And the vitamin D is 400 IUs, 100% daily requirements, with the calcium. That makes it absorb. Mm. And... Uh, I've been sold on this for some time after I heard that report, and I tell every patient I talk to, don't buy real expensive vitamins, and I mean D and uh, calcium if you've got osteoporosis. Get one combined because that way you have them at the same time, and that increases the absorption, and it's the cheapest one you can get. So I'm sure some people would like to know what, uh, what brand. Maybe, maybe we can send that, send that information to them later on, right? Well, on brand of what? Caltrade? Yeah. Is, is that the brand? Is that the name itself? Is the name yeah, itself? that's the brand. Got it. Okay, got it. All right, that, that would be good to know. Caltrade. Right. And, and you can get, it's 280 tablets per package. And it has advanced levels of vitamin D. And I saw the research, and this was the top of the list of absorption into the bones. Wow. They that did bone densities on it. And so yeah. ever since I saw that, it was a professor of endocrinology that presented it. And uh, I've told everybody since, go to Caltrate, because it's much cheaper. You save money. That is great information. I want to use that when I speak to my retirement home. Good. That would be a good thing to have in nursing home. Right. I used to go to 11 nursing homes, David. Really? Yep. Wow. All right. Someone asked a question now. Should we be concerned about soy being GMO? As a matter of fact, some people say, well, you got to be careful with the, with the soy in this country for some reason. I understand in Oriental countries in Asia, their, their, their soy is a lot purer and a lot better. But Let me answer that this way. Okay. I personally think we should be concerned about all GMO. Okay. You know, I, I'm really concerned about GMO. Because, right. see, here's the problem. 
if you've got 100 acres of GMO corn growing and 600 acres surrounding it, next year you're going to have probably 300 acres of GMO corn. And the next year you're going to have 700 acres total because pollination spreads the GMO corn. So it isn't going to be long where all corn in the United States will be GMO, hmm. unless you grow, grow them hydroponically inside where the pollen from GMO corn can't get to it. Probably a Chinese grocery store will be your best bet. You got it. For soy, right? Right, okay. for soy. I have about an 86 power slide PowerPoint just on the benefits of genestine, which comes from soy. Mm. All right. Well, we're going to be wrapping this up. Lots of lots of thank yous. I'm coming from the audience members saying what a wonderful presentation. Um, boy, we've got a lot of people who are very knowledgeable on. on on nutrition here, asking some really specific questions. Uh, okay, is it? If you want to, if they want to email me. Okay. You know. Yeah. Whatever um, you'd like. Sure. You want them to give? You, you can give your email address if you feel comfortable. Okay. In case you didn't get a question answered, my email is d o c s n a r f at kc.rr.com. That's doc like in doctor, D-O-C, then a word you've never heard of, snarf, and it's phonetically it's Susan Nancy Abel Rebecca Frank at kc.rr.com. And any questions that you didn't get to ask or I didn't get answered, and I just typed it in the, um, to, and sent it to all. So anybody who's asked a question, um, look in the answer box, and I just put his email address. Okay, good. Great. Excellent. And the last question here is, uh, what about almond milk instead of dairy products? Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> they must know me. She I does. quit drinking milk a long time ago, and my dad had a dairy. I quit drinking milk because of the hormone, BGH. I believe that's one of the causes of the mammoth amount of breast cancer we see in women from 42 to 55 years of age. Because there's little girls drinking milk and they get BGH, that's bovine growth hormone, that the hormones given to cows and dairies they increase the size of our udders. So they'll put out, normally a cow puts out 10 pounds of milk a day. If you give them enough BGH, they'll put out 100 pounds, and their udders will be dragging. They're so big. Well, the FDA had to increase the pus allowed in milk because of the contamination of those huge udders being drug around through the cow lots. Okay, so I went to almond milk. I love it. It's nutritious. It's got monounsaturated fats. It's great. Even the AMA says you should have almonds every day. The American Heart Association say you should have almonds. So what better thing than almond milk? Right. I like it better. And another thing, it doesn't spoil as quick. Hmm. It's got a dating about six weeks. That's pretty good. Yeah. It's a little more expensive, but to me it's worth it. And I use nothing but almond milk. I use it for everything that I use milk for. That's good to know as well. This, uh, we, you have shared a lot of gems today, tonight, Doc. Again, a uh, few more, a few more thank yous. Saying fantastic, thank you so much. Please speak again soon. <laughs> so, uh, well, I fought David for what eight months and told him I wasn't going to do a webinar. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> he wrote me in. And the rest, as they say, is history. Well, yeah, the rest is history. He was up. persistent, and he was compassionate toward me, and kind, and put up with all my 
dodgeability and all <laughs> stuff like that. I ran out of excuses, so I did one. <laughs> the powers of persuasion, eh, Sherry? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah we've hooked. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Dr. Bobby, thank you again. It's been great. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. I loved it. Appreciate you. Okay. All right, All right folks. Uh, you, you, it's been a wonderful webinar, and we shall see you hopefully tomorrow or on Thursday. Have a great evening or morning or afternoon. God bless. Good night. Good night.